Okay, welcome back everybody to the Winter School Digitizing the Materiality of the Pre-Modern Book. Today we will be talking about transcriptions and transcriptions using transcribers. We will not go into paleography because many of you already have these skills and also it's um, so different in different languages that it's better to learn the paleography that you need. And the ones of you who already know paleography probably already know their own paleography. This is why uh, I would like to spend some time with transcribers, learning how to transcribe things and also having a um, short look at how to reuse a model that already exists and how to train a model that, um, for your own data. Obviously, we won't have time mm -hmm. to actually train our own model, but just so you know theoretically how it works and whether that would be even uh, necessary for you, because many things can be done with pre-existing models and they can be done pretty well. Yeah, so um, what are transcriptions in a digital sphere? So we talk about OCR, that's optical character recognition. So for example, transcribers in our case, but there are um, other projects such as OCRD, for example, uh, in Germany. But since transcribers is also based in Innsbruck, uh, this is obviously um, a project that we're gonna use. And I personally use transcribers and I like it a lot. So uh, I hope you will enjoy it too. Mm. In the context of transcribers, we also often talk about HTR, that's handwritten text recognition. So it's not exactly the same thing as optical character recognition, because when we speak of OCR, that is often in the context of um, computer science and not necessarily historical text. So I guess the, the H could also stand for historical text recognition for our purposes. Mm, Transcribers has lots of features, such as transcribing, like I've already said, reusing models. There's a big user base um, that creates models and shares them so you can reuse other people's work or help improve other people's work. You can train your own models. You can um, collaborate with trans transcribers for bigger projects, but you can also use it as an individual user. But there are also features like keyword spotting, for example, that was developed for archives for texts that aren't fully HDR'd, where still um, the machine manages to spot certain keywords, which is interesting for archival materials to just see if certain keywords appear in a text. Mm. There is also a fuzzy search, meaning that um, it should also find words if it's mistranscribed or if there are smaller errors. Uh, it can also, it, transcription can also be relevant for um, writer identification, for example. So mm, when we want to convert, so to say, image data, or we start with the materiality, obviously, then we digitize it, or we transcribe directly from the book. But in our case, if we go from the digitized image, there are a few steps in between. So we need to convert images into text. And as you can see here, there is an example. I should probably zoom in, right, so you can properly see. Mm. So this is an example of a pixel-based digital image. And as you can see, mm, if it's optimized, we have um, a white background and black for where the f writing is. So this is a way that a computer can, for example, in a very, very much simplified way, identify writing. Um, so we can uh, measure things like the density of pixels per area. Uh, the distance between edges, um, angles between edges, and um, we can look at segments and uh, overlap. And so, as you can see, there are many, many factors to identifying words and digits. Important work in machine learning, for example, has been done um, in the context of the US postal system for um, digit identification. It's the so-called MNIST data set that's very important in machine learning, but obviously that's not the, what we're talking about here, just so, so you know. But essentially, these models can be trained to recognize writing, and if they can be uh, trained to recognize a modern type of writing, they can just the same be trained to recognize historical writing. It's just important that we have enough pages, enough example material, so to say, or training material, uh, for the machine to learn a certain type of writing. And with these normal OCR engines, that doesn't work so well because that's not what they were trained and optimized for. 
But in the case of transcribers, something that is meant for historical transcriptions, uh, these models are trained to recognize our historical text and they work really well, in my opinion. Obviously, there's always room for discussion. Some people want them to work even more perfectly or are critical, but I think overall it's a great tool that can help us with our work. So the processing steps, so just so you know, for um, converting text to images is digitizing. We've seen how that works. Uh, we do pre-processing. Maybe it's important for you to know the term pre-processing. That is, happens a lot in uh, the digital humanities. Also, when we, for example, uh, want to process text, we need to pre-process it linguistically. Mm. And in this case, it means we um, convert uh, into two bit images. We separate writing and background. We detect edges and we segment. In transcribers, the relevant steps will be that you first um, do a layout recognition step and then the actual text recognition. In the context of, for example, print, I have found that often with a good model, I can even get um, sufficient text quality with just doing text recognition. But then sometimes special features like multiple columns don't get recognized correctly. So it's important to let the computer know about the layout first. This is also something that you've seen in Sean's session on the MS description when he was putting these bounding boxes around segments of text. This is what layout recognition means. Yeah. So in the context of historical transcription, as you probably all know, we have typical phenomena such as special characters that are not necessarily covered by our typical keyboard. Mm, so historical characters or also characters typical for certain languages that are not necessarily covered by English, which would probably cause problems in a normal OCR engine as well, because these things are mostly trained on English. Mm, we have abbreviations. We have damaged or unreadable text, additions, deletions, uh, substitutions, corrections, editorial interventions such as emendations and conjectures that we might want to include, or additions and omissions. Uh, also, the editorial interventions that were done on the text and also the ones that we want to do ourselves. Because as you know, when I'm transcribing something, I'm following a set of rules. And also, as we've already talked about in my last session, it's important that we set these rules and then we adhere to them. But the same obviously goes for this. If I put uh, follow certain rules in my training material, this is what my engine will learn. So in this case, if you want to train a model, you need to put in the work first and think about how you want things transcribed because that's how all your data is going to be transcribed in the end. For example, we will be looking at the Noskemus model that's from the Innsbruck Noskemus project. It's a print model that works for uh, mainly Latin, but also inclusions of many other European languages and also uh, inclusion of ancient Greek in Latin uh, texts. And that model was, for example, trained to resolve ampersands to it, which is, uh, I guess, a valid choice. But I personally sometimes would have preferred to keep the ampersand. But since that was how the model was trained and the decision that the team making the model made at some point, this is what you get. Yeah, so here's a sneak peek of transcribers already, but we're going to see much more of that later. Yeah, so what is transcribers? The self-definition is that transcribers is a comprehensive platform for the digitization AI-powered text recognition, transcription, and searching of historical documents. We will be using Transcribers Lite, and uh, we have asked you to create an account. If you haven't done so already, it doesn't take a long time. Please uh, do so. And the website where this is currently found is transcribers.eu Lite. For more complexity, which um, I have to ha stress you might not ever need, you could download the Transcribers Expert software. This is what we usually use to access Transcribers over, and it was pretty complicated. I think it put lots of people off. And uh, I remember that I, in 2019, have written a blog post about how most people probably don't even use Transcribers in this detailed way. Lots of people maybe just want to reuse a print model. So I made a tutorial about 
how do I easily use transcribers for the print model because there were so many functionalities that it was hard to find your way around. And I think that that used to be something um, that was a little bit off-putting about transcribers for people. However, in the meantime, usability has been much, much improved, especially since transcribers is not funded anymore and they have to fund themselves. Obviously, it was um, a matter of uh, interest to them to improve this and it has gotten so much more usable. We will see that immediately. This is also why I won't have any slides on how to use transcribers because they provide their own how-to guides and they're really, really good and obviously get updated by the people who develop the system. So they're definitely correct. This is what I would recommend you use or I'm going to show you where they are. And I also think, well, light is easier to learn and the usability really is that great that often you don't even need to learn it. It will just prompt you to do the next logical step. However, yeah, it only has the essentials. So I think if you are making complicated transcriptions, it might be that you want to download the full version. You need a transcriber's account and you need to buy credits after you've used up your initial 200. So as far as I know, you get 200 credits at the beginning and then uh, you need to buy credits. They're not too expensive. Uh, credits also get used differently for print and for um, handwritten text recognition because print, even if it's historical print, takes up a lot less resources. These models are really good and so you can save money, I think especially it kind of evens uh, itself out because with handwritten text, often the copyright that you want to put in aren't as big. For example, I like to mass digitize hundreds and hundreds of pages of uh, recipe books and early modern print. And if that were the same price as the handwritten, that would be pretty expensive. Mm, but yeah, I've recently, I think, invested some money in transcribers credits and I've been following this, um, this software for a few years and I've loved it. So I'm happy to invest the money, I guess. However, if you are um, a grad student or you have an um, individual research project, there are stipends. So they basically offer you their services for free, but you have to apply. So it definitely, um, there definitely are these like, little grants for Austria, but I think there might also be for uh, grad students internationally. So I think definitely look into that. Um, yeah. This is the um, administrative things you need to know about transcribers. Here's just a little preview of what it looks like. This is the website, so you will see that uh, yourselves. This is just um, the entry point to Transcribers Lite. And they say about it that Transcribers Lite is the browser version of Transcribers. Uh, automatically transcribe, comfortably edit, and easily collaborate on historical documents. And with Transcribers Lite, you can train your own AI models in your browser. And Transcribers Expert, um, the expert client is the standalone version of Transcribers with the full power of the Transcribers platform, digitization, AI-powered recognition, transcription, and searching of historical documents. So if you are working on a train, maybe, and you don't have um, great internet, maybe you want to use the expert thing as well. I personally use Lite and I'm pretty happy with it, but I mostly use it to just upload my data that I need internet for that anyway, and then uh, start the model and then it's running. So I'm not actually on the platform a lot. However, when you're working with documents, for example, medieval handwritten text, uh, you will be transcribing things. Maybe it will be easier for you to not work in the browser where you have, need to have constant internet connection. And this is a little overview of the, um, of the how-to guides. Mm. There is a big area where you can learn about how to get started, uh, download an installation, how to upload documents, how to run the layout analysis, how to run handwritten text recognition, how to train models. Then there's transcribers in 10 steps, how to transcribe documents, how to train and apply models, a transcribers light introduction, and how to use structural tagging because Transcribers also allows you to do some tagging and to download your data as TI as well. That also, I think, used to be a big point of contention about Transcribers because the resulting TI wasn't ideal and this has been much, much improved. So now many of the old criticisms about Transcribers that I think lots of people who have been in the digital humanities community um, for a longer period of time, that they have known about Transcribers or maybe 
um, yeah, judgments they have had about it, they don't necessarily apply anymore. So uh, if you have tried transcribers in the past and didn't like it, I would highly recommend that you look into it again. I feel like it's a really good product now. Mm, yeah, so there are also teaching videos and their events and user conferences. So there's a whole transcribers uh, environment and community that you can also make use of. Mm. So here um, is a short example on uh, a model that I tra trained myself. Essentially, the concrete things that I did here don't matter because if you're going to do it, you're going to open the how-to guide and follow it step by step for your own data, but just so you have a first impression of what it looks like. Mm. So this is a text by Michael Meyer. It's a handwritten text. Um, as you know, I usually work with Michael Meyer's prints. <laughs> I've <laughs> told you about it uh, many times. But there are a few handwritten texts by Meyer. And so I tried to um, train a model for his handwriting. This is a sh short snippet about making gold, as always. And as you can see, there's the, there's the Latin text. And here are lines of uh, transcription. So as you can see here, Mm, this is highlighted. That's obviously not in the in the actual um, image scan. This is a highlighting because I have clicked onto this line of transcription. So transcribers knows what is what, which is obviously essential for transcribing. But you can also see from here that this is what it automatically detected as a line. So the line detection works uh, pretty well. And then in the resulting TI, you also have a linking between these lines and lines of transcription, which you may or may not need, but you can always clean up your files afterwards. And it just, this way it just keeps lots of information. Yeah, so if you wanted to train a tra your own model, you first transcribe a number of pages. Currently they recommend 25 to 75 pages, depending on whether it's print or handwritten. I think I have worked with maybe 30 for this model. And it's not too bad. I would have to improve the model, but I never got around to doing it. But um, you could also build on base models if you find a similar handwriting uh, and then uh, improve that model. So it would work uh, in the way that you um, link the base model, let it transcribe your text, and then there will be mistakes. And then you fix those mistakes, and then you retrain it with those uh, mistakes fixed, and then it will learn where it made a mistake and hopefully improve for the next time. Mm. But with the base models, the same thing applies that I just mentioned about transcription guidelines. So the model might have used transcription guidelines that are not yours. So if you wanted to respect your transcription guidelines, you might have to change things. And that can be, um, that can take a while. I mean, 75 pages isn't excessively much, but it will take a while. For example, I know that I really like uh, one model, the uh, Wiener Diarium model for German texts. And I think because it was an Austrian text, it would transcribe und as und, like with an O instead of a U. But I was transcribing German text and I wanted it to be transcribed as a U. So that was, um, yeah, I guess that was a, an issue that I had to live with in this case or correct it myself. I could have improved the model, but in this case, it was practically perfect for my purposes. I just wanted to have a transcription of the text that kind of worked. And because it always made the same mistake, you can also search and replace it to correct. Obviously, using search and replace over a, a huge number of documents or a long document is potentially problematic because you could misreplace something. But yeah, in this case, that was a risk I was willing to take. Anyway. So you can speed up the process of transcription by um, creating a model on the minimum number or the minimum recommended number. I think it's not going to stop you from using less than the minimum number. It might just not work, work very well. Um, but you can just create the model, run it on your pages that need to still to be transcribed, and then correct those pages. Because if it's not too bad a model, this will actually still be much faster than transcribing from scratch. So this is something that you could do and then repeat the process. But of course, you need to take into account that it will cost credits. So if you do that for a high number of pages, that might cost some money. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So 
maybe I'll also mention a word that I put on the slides and I say so that you should train your model using gold standard transcription. So the gold standard is an ideal standard that we use for machines to learn, just so you have heard about that term. Yeah. And so, yeah, there will probably be errors. So you fix them and then you use the new training data to improve the model. Mm. And this is what I mean by um, when I say that the usability got so much better. I think, honestly, this is pretty self-explanatory. You put in a name and a description. This is important if you ever want to share it or also just remember what it was. For me, for example, I know this is just the handwriting of one author and I just want to use it to digitize this one longer manuscript. But if it's for a general type of writing, you would um, declare what type of data went into it and so on, what period it belongs to. And you will also add a language. And it will also, it will want to know in what centuries. But this is pretty easy. Then you, then it asks you for the training data and the validation data, and then you can get started. It will take a while, and then it will notify you that your model is ready, and you can run your model on uh, new data. So what's the, yes? There's no only the language. There are only options for, there are no options for oriental language. Aren't there? I think there are models for oriental languages. I'm not sure there are for all of them, but I think at least in the development, there definitely are some. I'm not sure if there are in the, um, in the ready to use ones. But for example, I am definitely aware of Arabic and Hebrew being done. I'm not sure about um, many other Oriental languages. So maybe I'm using that leg version. Or what? what? So these, some of these are separately uh, developed, like the Ethiopic version yep. exists only at the Benedict Sahaf Center in Hamburg. Yeah. yeah, so I guess they might end up being published later, but they might not publish them before they're ready, I think. But I assume it would be in everybody's interest if they did publish them. So in this case, maybe you might have to wait a while or also just contact people that you know are working on this or find out who might be working on it. And they might share their models with you. For example, I know my colleague from Innsbruck, Stefan Tatama, who um, created the Noskemos model, which is my favorite model that I always use for print. And so, I know him and he knows that I work on alchemical things. So he asked me if I could input some uh, alchemical symbols and transcriptions of alchemical symbols uh, for that to improve the model. So if you're doing work, uh, it might be well worth contacting people who are creating models in bigger projects and you can contribute and also then profit from what they've already done. So I think that's also what's great about transcribers. It's a community and it uh, allows for collaborative editing and um, yeah, you can give anybody who has a, has a transcriber's account access to your collections and to your transcriptions and to your models and so on. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's a community of users that also created this great base of existing models that can be reused. So obviously try to give back to the community if you want or can. Uh, there's a few more further reading from my own blog, I'm not sure the 2019 post is still relevant. I think that was a pretty popular post back then. It was called How to Historical Text Recognition, a Transcriber's Quick Start Guide. And that was how to use, reuse existing models for print on the examples of the uh, Noskemos General Model 4. And at the time, there wasn't Transcriber's Lite, so I was using the expert editor. And it was very confusing, so I put in screenshots of how to do it. And I think that was helpful for a lot of people. But in the meantime, Transcribers has tutorials like that um, made by Transcribers officially. So I guess I would recommend you to look there because they're probably more up to date. And then I also put in uh, at, like my experiences training my own model in the post, training my own handwritten text recognition model on Transcribers Lite. Uh, that is more like my experiences. I didn't want to give a tutorial because I felt the tutorials had gotten so good in the meantime that I didn't want to repeat them or maybe um, miscommunicate something. So I think if you want to use those materials, uh, that would work very well. Yeah, so 
I'd say let's get into it. Maybe I'm gonna just open the transcriber's website first. So this is what uh, you see when you just enter um, transcribers.eu. It will um, redirect you to the Read Corporation. Mm. And as you can see, it's a very beautiful website. You can watch a video about it. You can sign up for free. Um, it shows you the different types of editors available. Sorry. Over 80,000 registered users, over 12,000 AI models trained, and over 31 million pages processed. And more than 90 public AI models. We can maybe look into those for a second. For example, transcribers German current. Transcribers print multi-language. French, multi-language print. Many different types of fonts. You could just um, Google what you're looking for yourself, uh, search what you're looking for um, yourselves, and see if there is a model for it. And here, that's also maybe relevant. It says uh, which languages it's for. It says what alphabet it uses, and it says the CER number, that's the character error rate. So this indicates how well the model performs. Obviously, for handwritten text recognition models, this number is higher than for print. As you can see here is the handwriting one that has 6.19, and this one has 0.08 for a typewritten. Here we can see um, there is a non-Western one, so I'm glad. Um, yeah, uh, it would be really fun if you could try it out and uh, let me know how it works. It does have a pretty decent character error rate. And yeah, I guess we have seen a good number of these things. I'm just so excited about them all. I need to stop scrolling. <laughs> uh, and here you can also select by century. You can select by language. There's Croatian as well. Mm -hmm. So it seems like when you have the option to select a language over on the left side, there, there's a limited number of languages. They do have more options when you're actually going in to transcribe the document. Ah, uh -huh, OK. Thanks. So yeah, we'll look into it once uh, once we're in it. I'm also going to show you in my account. You can select material. Although it seems here like there is um, that was not uh, in the search criteria. You can select by character error rate. Although I'm not quite sure what people would do with it, but maybe computer scientists would use this to look how the best models work, for example, or whether there are commonalities between the best models. I assume. And you can uh, look for a script as well, which might be relevant. Yeah, and here it says CR stands for character error rate and defines how many percent of the characters had been transcribed the wrong way by the neural network. This is what you need the validation set for. And this is essentially you have a training set with the gold standard data and then the validation set. And these are used to um, determine how well the model performs. Let me let me search for Noschemus, my favorite model. So this model, the Noschemus general model, is called printed Latin and Greek, also German, English, Italian, 15th to 19th century. Mm, and if you click onto these models, you will get this explanation text that you saw in the slides where it says to describe the model. In this case, it says it's able to read a printed Latin text, especially from the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th century. The model was released by Stefan Satama and is based on training data coming from the digital source book of the Noschemus project. That was an ERC project working on early modern uh, neo-Latin uh, science literature. This might be relevant because it will probably perform better on that very similar type of text than others. However, it's a very, very good model. It says here that 
Although the model is tailored towards transcribing Neo-Latin texts set in Antiqua-based typefaces, it is also to a certain degree able to handle Greek words and words set in German fraktur. Because this is what these books look like. They have different um, fonts in them. So obviously they try to improve it, the model as much as possible to transcribe that well. I think what it doesn't handle so well yet is alchemical symbols. And I also know that I think this is version 4, but I have access to version 5 and I will probably be contributing to that. So it's just interesting to know that these things are still being worked on. And if you find that um, you have to correct errors on a specific type of text, you might just want to contact the people creating this model and say, hey, I can share my data with you and you can include it in the general model so other people can um, make use of that as well. And here it says that the the character error rate is 0 0.91. And so in my experience, that means there is one or two errors on a page, and some of them are actually missing white spaces. So some of them aren't even mistranscribed characters. Also, missing white spaces are included in this, and sometimes in print, uh, as you can see here, the spacing is not always even, and sometimes it doesn't recognize uh, whether it, the whether it's two words or just one. So that would also count as one of those errors. And also, uh, as far as I know, Transcribers has a certain language awareness. So even if you have a handwriting that is, for example, in the case of Michael Meyer, who sometimes writes in German and sometimes in Latin, I have found that Transcribers does seem to take the language into account. And when I ran the model in German, it was much worse. But that might have been my mistake but I think it would take language into account as well. That's why it um, specifies which languages it works for. I've also run this model on French and it wasn't, it wasn't that bad either. It just makes some mistakes, but if you use this model for French and you correct mistakes, just send in the pages that you corrected and the model will learn. And also there's, yeah, no, it's not a link. It just says simply upload the picture and test this model and we will do that now. Oh, maybe also as, as an advertisement, they have a scan tent. So the idea was that you should be able to digitize things fast with your own phone. So the scan tent sets up an um, OK digitization environment uh, where you can take pictures with your phone. That will work for transcribers to train models and so on. Obviously, the better the pictures, the more successful you will be. But it also works with not that great pictures. So it costs 200 euro. And there's lots of info and an app for it, apparently. Yeah, so as you can see, the website is really user friendly now. And this is what it looks like from the inside. We're just going to look at Transcribers Lite today. I'm just maybe going to increase this. And um, so I have uploaded a few images of, um, of the books that we saw into the Dropbox. However, um, Please don't share them. They're just for use in this workshop. Let's uh, look at the Ortus, for example. And this nice page. I'm going to download this. And let's just try out a few functionalities. Wait. This is quick text rec. Quick oh, would have had to upload it, sorry. Language. What is the Ortus in? I, it's in Latin, I think. Yes. It's printed and Latin. And then I would always, in this case, I would uh, select image because I'm uploading a si single image. If I'm uploading a whole PDF, I would go for PDF. And then it just asks you to drag and drop. Um, you can choose a collection where to put it into. I think I only have this e-learning one now, but I have many others. File is too large. Oops. Okay, we might have to resize our files. Um, then let's just get something else. Oh, here. So many great options for me to include Michael Maya in everything that I do. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to say upload and start recognition. 
So this is the quick text recognition option. I personally wouldn't usually go about it like that. I would usually just upload a whole PDF of my uh, printed books and, um, and then do layout recognition first. Upload is complete. Oh yeah. Now, um, what I always do is I look into the jobs tab, which is um, a very addictive thing because when you have lots of processes running, I'm always refreshing and <laughs> checking. But as you can see here, uh, it created two jobs. That was create document. It's finished now. And the other one that says text recognition. And now I can, there's a link to the document and I can just jump to it. It will open it like this. So because this is also in, uh, intended for uh, transcribing whole PDFs full of pages or books, it will come up in this sort of collection. Yeah, and as you can see, it, f it found this as well. It finds lots of text all over the um, title page. But this was a quick text recognition without um, specifying which model. I just said it's in Latin. So this is pretty good. However, now I would like to uh, use layout recognition and then text recognition with the model of my choice that I know and like and see does it get any better? But also, um, uh, as you might remember, I used a relatively bad quality image from Google. So this is pretty impressive. As you can see, it's very pixelated. Mm, I'm just going to try and see if this. Uh -huh. So this is the layout that it um, recognized. You could edit this. Obviously, if you're um, trying to make your own transcriptions and you want to actually improve these models, you can edit around in this. I usually just go with what I have, because when I do uh, lots of digital humanities work, it's OK to work with messy data to a certain degree. For example, linguists also tend to um, work with a certain error rate. So I don't need the, uh, the transcriptions to be perfect necessarily, just good enough. Mm. So this is view. This is the text view. OK. But let's just go to my um, scarily large Michael Meyer collection. And I'm going to go and find this. Oh, no, I didn't actually. Yeah. This isn't actually that good. Wait a second. This is not as good as it I normally have. Let's go to my books of secrets test. Mm. Let's go to this one. These are some of the books of secrets that I already told you about. And this is really pretty good. What you can see here is that the uh, marginalia weren't correctly detected. That some, it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. But this might actually have been an example where I didn't use layout recognition first. So in your own practice, maybe just try it with and without layout recognition. I do feel that with layout recognition, it works better, especially if you have multiple columns. Because if you don't use the layout recognition first, the columns won't come out nice. And as I've already showed you in the short snippet on the slides, if you just click on one of these lines, or also click here, it will always link up which lines are belong to each other. Sometimes uh, it leaves the sta page status in progress, even though it's actually done. I don't know what this is. I think it's probably a bug. But that has always been happening. For example, here now I could also start training. But in this case, I'm not sure if it's going to accept it like this. OK. This is something between the 16th and 18th century. OK, now I could uh, load up training data and select some as validation data and then get it started. I think maybe if you have some pages or maybe if you just have some um, examples lying around in your own computer that you already have transcribed, where you have the image and the transcription, you might want to try that out with the training. Um, and this actually guides you through what you need to do. So it's, it's pretty self-explanatory.
For example, in this case where I trained my own model, I uh, got a transcription from a colleague of mine. I think this was the validation set. And I think I also, yeah, I had a correct um, transcription for this that was made by a colleague of mine. I actually put in some work putting, uh, converting it to my own transcription standards. Uh, it was too much work to convert it completely to what I wanted, but I just changed a few things that I didn't want it to do. Mm. So how you would do that is just, you can just, in the text view, you can just, you can just edit this, which obviously I don't want to do. And you could also run recognition here. This is the layout view again. Here it detected even which are the bounding boxes for the different words. And it tells me when I ran this model. Oh, don't save, I don't want to save it. Um, yeah, so we could also uh, upload something here and I could also, here's the users manager, so I could give you all access to this, um, to this collection if you wanted to. We could work on something together. Um, we can manage the roles, owner, editor, transcriber. We can add people and search them by email. We just need to know what the email is that is associated with the transcriber's account. Mm, and here in the transcribers organizer, I have my collections. I have a tag manager, recent documents, and jobs. Mm, let's go back to collections. Um, yeah. Are there any questions so far? I think we should, um, yeah, get working. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I uh, drag and drop my file into the recognition window. And the languages uh, that I can select for it are pretty scarce. Mm -hmm. There's just like 10 languages. That's what I was there, trying so. to point out. Yeah, I, I think it's because you're in print. Is it a printed document? No. Yeah, so okay. for some reason, everybody's like stuck in print yeah. and can't. Uh, I mean, if, I, if mm -hmm. I switch to German, then I have this handwritten printed option which I can switch. Oh. But uh, if I. Uh, for example, they don't just have leave a check. Yes. Yes. It's uh, just printed for maybe. But the document which I uploaded is uh, Cyrillic and it's Slavonic. So. And they should have that when you go to do the They do have that. They do yeah, have so that. I'm confused about why this front is yeah. it, It's just frustrating because it's the first step. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so did you create, uh, upload a new document or did you do the quick? I just recognition. Your I just uh, drag and drop. Mm -hmm. So maybe it would be better if you created a collection and did it properly. I mean, I do have some my collections. But I could also invite you to the common one. Maybe that would be a good thing to do now. If you all want to work in the same collection, you can obviously also just do your own I, I, things. I do, I do it here. Yes. Where is it? I do it through, through Too many tabs open now. I can't find my way around anymore. Oh, and by the way, Megan, you might you might be familiar with this one. I know, I saw. You saw. And this is actually a pretty good transcription. I'm pretty happy with this one. Yeah, you're probably when it's in the collection, I can edit the file inside a collection and then choose handwritten or printed and stuff. Yeah, so maybe maybe put it in a collection because I think that has the full functionality. I think the quick text recognition is just to play around. That's not what I would be using. Mm, and also maybe something to um, notice, there are a few, I'm gonna call them HDR artifacts, so there's a little bit of junk or something mm, that you might want to remove. Or for example, for me, if I want to create uh, Latin texts that I can use for natural language processing, so automated computer processing, I don't necessarily want this even though if we're transcribing the materiality of the book and the bibliographical description, obviously we want that. But I usually would delete that. So that depends on what you want. And of course, uh, if you want that encoded in TI, there are options for how you do that. Um, but 
you'd obviously have to mark it up. That's maybe also something that we could try. Not sure how, not sure this actually works in transcribe with light. Um, yeah, so you can put tags here. Oh, how would you um, make it recognize initials as well? Mm, I think in, wait a second, now I'm stuck in this. How do I get back here? Nope. Oops, wait. Um, yeah, so I have highlighted this, just a second. I clicked here on tags. There's also a virtual keyboard, there's increased font size, and there are a few options here. And for example here, I can put some elements that are clearly already um, inspired by the TI. Um, but you could also manage your own tags. So if you know that you always need some that are not in here, you can add them. And the initial, I think in this case, wasn't recognized. However, you could do that however you wanted. Maybe you would mark it as its own region and give it the transcription of the initial, but also tag it as an initial. Okay. That's how I would do it. If, if, and if you did that, would the um, would transcribers then learn that whenever it saw that sort of woodcut again, it would recognize it as being O, or would you have to do it manually? Um, um, I'm not sure how good it would be at recognizing these things because they do look very different. Maybe the machine learning would recognize the, that the common thing is these letters, but I'm not sure it would know that this is what it's about. So, you know, it might recognize some of the people on it and think that that's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then transcribe them all as O, oh, even though it's just the same people. So I wouldn't know about that, but I think they're just the initials, so they're easy to check and yeah. I think it's, yeah, the main text is gonna hopefully work. How would you um, transcribe an, an item, a printed item with um, manuscript marginalia? Would that be two separate individual jobs or can you have two models working on the same thing at the same time? Yeah, as far as I know, you can actually run multiple models, but that's a bit more complicated. Okay. Uh, I'd also have to look that up myself, but I think there are tutorials on that that also exists. Mm. Wait, I don't want to share this page. Something else that I want um, to just show you is how do I download this? So in this case, I want to select all the pages and I want to download and then let's see what happens. I don't want to download the images because it's going to take forever. Let's do a docx and a ti. So this starts a server download, and I will get an email to my associated email address where I can download this and it will expire after, after a bit. Open oxygen, so. And then obviously you can edit in, the, in oxygen in the XML directly. However, if you wanna keep correcting in transcribers, that's not a great idea, so. You should finish your work in transcribers and then download, and then only keep working in the TI. It's because obviously, if you edit in the TI, I think you, there would be a way of putting it back in there, but I think with light, that's definitely not possible. I think you can definitely do that as an advanced user on your own machine. Also, something that might be relevant is there is an API now, I think, it's called Metagrafo, and um, that will allow you to run some of the models on your own machine because the reason that you pay for this pricing is obviously the, so the product gets developed and maintained and so on, but also because it's being run on their servers. So they have to pay for the computing power. If you run it on your own machine, yeah, you get it cheaper. And so if you have lots of things to digitize, you might wanna do that. And I guess it also would give you more control over how, how things are going. Okay, so let's check if I already received the email, that, although that might take a while. Oh no, it's here. So now I received this uh, zip file that says export job and here's the docx file. Let's see what that looks like. As you can see, there are a few transcribers artifacts. In my case, I would just, I don't do a lot of post-processing. I just kick out those obvious junk things. Sometimes I also do that computer-based because if you're running it through Python, for example, I would get rid of, um, these words that just hang around and that just consist of one letter. Yeah, but 
so this is what it would look like. And then if you, if you work with zips, it's important to always unzip it. That is a common uh, mistake that people don't unzip their zip files because especially Windows will let you work with it as though it were unzipped, but then it doesn't let you save it and people get confused why it doesn't do that. Oh, I hope we didn't just get the metadata, the whole thing. Oh no, I just downloaded the metadata. Well, and see if it comes up. But I do own a, an XML version of this thing, so I just don't know where it is now. No. In the meantime, if I can ask, um, I've been wondering, can you delete the same area from the lake file if you own several pages at the same time? Meaning you have the, the gather signature in one of the pictures. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, can you remove, for instance, in my case, I did it this once with uh, some library downloaded thing, and mm -hmm. it had the logo, and I translated like transcribed it once, and then it was everywhere. Is there any way to like delete it from the layout across all pages? Once? Oh, something like the sometimes they have the digitized by Google thing that comes up all the Let's time. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, is, can you do simultaneous changes in all pages of the layout? Well, so from what I know, you can, for example, um, edit the the XML on your machine mm -hmm. and then put it back in. But I think that's obviously not possible with light. So if you have a more advanced setup, that is theoretically possible. I know, for example, of a colleague in Vienna who used to do automated corrections, like search and replace, and then fed it back into the system. But you need to be a bit of more of an expert user. But what would also work is if you just delete it each time and then train a model, then it knows not to transcribe that, maybe. Uh, That's something that I would think is maybe the quickest workaround. Mm. Yeah, let's check if it's going to give us a TI download. Otherwise, I need to find my TI download. Wait. For this last picture that you had now, mm -hmm. uh, what model should, would you recommend? Wait a second. Which, which last picture? The autos? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm. Well, so it's Latin, so I would first look for Latin models. Um, and well, then... Yes, but Noschemus has a bit of a, it's for these Garamond type fonts, you know. And this is not necessarily, it is a font that because it's incunable, the font looks more like handwriting. So maybe you could look for something for the century, like 16th century. I think it's 16th, 15th, so 16th century. So search by that and just search your way around and then see what the result is. Maybe also let us know. Did you want me to link you? Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to and the line um, recognition was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now I'm trying to figure out which model to use for the vector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is one example of um, of the Sommerhof uh, alchemy lexicon. It's a Latin German lexicon. Let's reformat this and hope it doesn't time out. Oh yeah. So this is the TI that would come out. Maybe I need to increase the size a little bit. So this is what comes out. So this title is the PDF title. So you might have to obviously edit that. And as author, it um, has the historical author. But as principal, it puts the email address of Stefan Satama, who is responsible for the model. So if you keep working this, you will probably want to Mm, edit all these things and then what it does is it has um, as you might remember after the TI header we often have text but if you work with images you have a sibling element that's called facsimile and so this is what opens up here and it describes surfaces and it will describe each of these lines that it detected as um, a set of points which is very complicated since you don't have to do it yourself. It doesn't matter. Oh, wait a second. But mm, so in my case, when I was working on this with students, I took the 10 minutes that it took to scroll down this whole thing and delete all of that because I didn't want it. And it was very distracting. And it can, um, 
it's, it's a very long document and it will obviously get slowed down. <laughs> this is, I think, a 500, 600 page um, book. So it has lots of these zones defined, each single line that is, was detected. So in this case, um, I told the students to just delete this so they can, they're free to navigate in their document again without getting lost in this all the time. Watch a second, where's the beginning? As you can see, there is about seven or 8,000 uh, lines of this. So what I would have done is scrolled up until I found that point where it begins here. So I would, have, would delete the whole facsimile element, I think. But then you have all these ideas, IDs um, linking up to it. So you have these, um, for example, page beginnings that link to this facsimile. So if you just delete them all together, you might want to get rid of it because then your oxygen is going to validate and see that this doesn't exist anymore. So what I would do was use um, a regular expression to search and replace. I don't know if you're familiar with regular expressions. So you can uh, use regular expressions in oxygen. However, it's, I guess it's a bit of an advanced thing and I think it's a bit out of the scope of this beginners class. But if you want to clean documents, that can be very helpful. So I would um, highlight regular expression here. And then I know uh, I'm going to look at what is the shape of this thing? What I want to do with it is basically just delete it. I want to get rid of this whole thing. Mm, and so now this part, I'm going to replace by this expression. You don't need to know what it means. It just means anything, but in a non-greedy way. If that doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't matter. This is just, you just replace it. And then I would replace it here as well. If I wanted to keep the contents of this, I could access them in the replace with dollar one. That would be for the one first parenthesis and dollar two for the second one. But actually in this case, I just want to delete it. So this would essentially find all things that look like this. And I think I got to replace them by a space because there's this other attribute and otherwise I'm going to um, cause a clash. So I'm going to replace this. I'm going to search so it found this and then replace and now it's gone. And then I would try that a few times to make sure it really only finds the things that I wanted to find because regular expressions, especially when I say give me everything, that's the parenthesis dot asterisk question mark, it means anything and that's a bit of a dangerous thing to ask of it. So you want to check for a few times whether this is really what you want to find. And then you can say delete all and it's going to clean this whole thing. Mm. Something else that you might want to get rid of, for example, if it came out like this, is this type thing. In this case, you don't even need a regular expression because it's always like this. But so the transcriber's output created a, an empty type attribute that is illegal because uh, the TI validator doesn't want that. So if you have illegal things going on, uh, that might hinder your TI document from working, which is why you would also want to just replace all of them and delete them. So this is a not actually an introduction to regular expression, mm -hmm. but you could also use regular expressions like this. I don't know. This doesn't say Somerhof, but maybe we want to find Somerhof. Wait, I'm going to start a parenthesis and I'm going to say Somerhof. And then I'm going to put, put a pipe operator. That's the the um, line like this, and in this case it says Fomerhof because that, and I'm going to put an asterisk. Asterisk means mm, as many other characters that you want, which is a little dangerous because obviously uh, only until the next space, maybe like this. Hello. So it will find Somerhof and Fomerhof. Maybe we could look for other mistakes, it would also find Somerhof um, capitalized because I said um, if I don't um, check this, it will be case insensitive. If I wanted to be case sensitive, I would have to put this, but I, I don't want it. 
in this case, it also I wanted to find the whole name. So I could modify my regular expression. I could just make a longer list. For example, if I know that there's Sommerhof with an S, I could put this and just add it. In this case, what you want to do is you always want to put the longest first, because otherwise it's not going to find the other ones anymore. Sorry, I'm going a bit off topic here, but I don't know. Maybe this is going to be relevant. Mm, and then. If you found them all, you might want to correct them all. Although, as I said, if you do this, if you run this process over a long document, that's a little risky because you're not checking whether that's what's actually in the transcription. But this is a way how you could mass correct a mistake where you're sure that's always uh, the same mistake. So if I want that back, I could just write Somohov. So in this case, it would replace all these by Somohov which is maybe not what I want. If I want to be more safe, I can just write a TI element. I could just say first name and N, that stands for label, as I said, and Somerhof. And then I get whatever it found in this parenthesis, whichever of these options. And then I close my element. Obviously, search and replace all is a big source for mistakes, so be ready to undo um, and always check what you did. So I'm just going to search, hello, not often, and I'm going to replace. And now it replaced this, or it put an element around this. This is a very, very brief introduction to um, search and replacing using regular expressions. Mm, I have a video on this in German, but you can usually create auto subtitles, and it shows you how to do this in Oxygen, which I think is the most important thing, that you see visually how it works. But yeah. This is just uh, something that might be interesting, but this is what came out of transcribers. This is pretty okay uh, TI. It doesn't have lots of things because I didn't do anything to the document in transcribers. Uh, and it has obviously lots of these uh, references that I personally don't want, so that I would delete. But other than that, it's really solid output. And as you can also see, maybe here, one last thing. Uh, I said yesterday how uh, XML has so uh, special characters that are being es escaped by an ampersand. And so this is uh, places where there was an it ampersand sign. And this is how it came out. And this is a sign that was placed uh, whenever there was a line, uh, a, a word break over a line break. The, they decided in the model to put a sign like this so that if you converted this into just text output, you could reunite those words and then use natural language processing, so automated computer processing to process the Latin behind it. So all these things, like potential reuses of your model, are things that you might want to take into account when coming up with your transcription rules. This character, because it's uh, unique, it's not just a minus, it's this um, logical sign. Mm, the logical um, negation, basically, uh, usually doesn't appear in the texts. So they picked the character that they could just search and replace and be sure that they're not accidentally replacing something else. So you might want to think about that. OK. Yeah, so uh, as I always do, I've been talking for a long time. And um, uh, I hope you're already having fun trying some of this out. I invite you to try more of it out.